Bugatti has devised a crazy car that will blow everyone's mind. This time, the car that will replace the Chiron has little to do with the previous models. While the rest of the world was shrinking, moving to turbos, and switching to smaller volume engines, Bugatti moved in the opposite way with the V16. That's right, this time it wasn't W, but V16, with an 8.3-liter atmospheric engine. In the first part of supercars, I will talk about this marvel of engineering. To support our channel and see more content similar to this one, you can subscribe and like the video before continuing. Don't forget to turn on notifications. Let's go on. Internal combustion is gradually being phased out by all automakers. The switch to electricity has started. They are developing hybrids. One of the most notable aspects of this is their transition to lower capacity turbo engines. Ferrari no longer uses the classic naturally aspirated V8. While Lamborghini announced that the car that will replace the Huracan would return as a turbo, Bugatti took the other approach. According to the CEO's comment, the initial desire was not as stated. Volkswagen proposed developing an entirely electric SUV for Bugatti. Of course, this would be devastating news for automobile enthusiasts and the whole business, but the CEO stated that we would build a hypercar, as opposed to Volkswagen, would not make it electric, and would take the opposite approach. It is essentially a hybrid automobile that evolved from the concept of a crazy car, but the engine has been entirely redesigned. When we examine the prior models, Bugatti W16 has an 8-liter engine with four turbochargers. It was the result of a chaotic situation that will most likely never happen again. This time, when the V16 environment returned from the W16, things altered dramatically. Because V16 is not an engine type found in such a standard, nor is W16, but rather leaving an existing platform and designing an engine from scratch. It's ridiculous in this day and age. We're familiar with V8, V10, and V12, but when it comes to V16, there aren't many examples, particularly in road cars. Cadillac tried it once in the 1940s, but they didn't want to build a hypercar like this. They wanted to make a statement at the time. It features a 7-liter engine with 185 horsepower, which is not a popular choice. There has been no other example since, and the sound is unlike anything we've heard before. It does not look like anything. This isn't only because it's AV16. There are further adjustments. When you check inside the engine, you'll notice that it's rather lengthy, with a crank that's one meter long. When we look at the arrangement of this crank, we see that two cross-plane V8 are added end to end. That is why the sound is so distinct. What is a cross-plane? V8 engines come with two types of crankshafts. When seen from the side, the crank only appears in one plane. This is the flat plane style. Everything is quite symmetrical for this kind. According to the ignition order, the symmetrical cylinders on the right and left sides ignite simultaneously. Cross-plane engines are popular among Americans. Looking at it from the side, you can see two overlapping planes. This, of course, alters the firing sequence. This time, the ignition order is not symmetrical. It does not occur simultaneously on the right and left sides, as on a flat plane. And this is one of the most prominent elements of the American V8 line, which produces that roaring sound. Flat planes often turn greater RPM. Examples are the Ferrari 458, E92 M3, and S65. They constantly rev higher, and they have a racing attitude. The V8 with a cross-plane crank is more compact, similar to the American model. These are engines that are not designed to spin loudly or at high speeds. When we looked at Bugatti's V16, they combined two V8 with cross-plane, so we didn't anticipate it to turn a high rev here, but according to the latest photographs, Jesus, this engine turns 9,500 RPM. Of course, because it is atmospheric, it cannot generate as much power as the Chiron. This internal combustion engine can only generate 1,000 horsepower. 
The maximum figure observed in a road car with an atmospheric engine was between 800 and 900 horsepower in the atmospheric V12, but 1,000 horsepower was attained with the V16 here. The initial engineering problem for this vehicle was to integrate this extremely long engine into the available area without affecting the vehicle's length when it transitioned from W16 to V16. This incredibly long engine was extended by 25 centimeters in total. However, the engineer stated that we do not want to construct a car longer than the Chiron. They told us not to modify anything. It was a daunting effort to accommodate this big 25 centimeter gap into the same container, but they succeeded. There is a second issue. Since the previous model had 1600 horsepower, the new Turbolion model is likely to have somewhat higher power. It should be more powerful, yet this atmospheric engine can generate 1000 horsepower. Of course, electric motors, which are so useful nowadays, come to the rescue. As a result, this vehicle is classified as a hybrid rather than a plug-in, which means it cannot be plugged into charge. You can only generate and store power using energy from either brake recycling or the engine. It cannot be plugged into the socket. There are three electric motors, two at the front, one in each of the front wheels, and one in the transmission at the back. Although it appears that each has 400 horsepower, for a total of 1200 horsepower, the batteries were unable to transmit this much power. Therefore, there was a restriction of 800 horsepower and internal combustion at 1000. It can generate 1800 horsepower in total and in this manner. They were able to make it more powerful than the previous model Chiron. It features a 25 kilowatts battery. It can be driven electrically and has a range of around 60 to 70 kilometers using solely electric motors. You may be wondering who would buy this automobile and drive it electric. However, Bugatti's CEO stated that in the future, governments would begin to restrict the locations where internal combustion engines may be used, particularly in Europe. They will not allow internal combustion engines in urban areas, yet we want this vehicle to be ageless. We want it to last for years, therefore future access to those locations will be limited to electric vehicles. It is a pretty sensible concept. The other one, as you could expect, is a combination of internal combustion and electricity where everything works. The third option allows you to use simply the internal combustion engine. This is a little unusual. Who would like to do this? But they stated in the press release that we don't know who will use it, but our consumers aren't idiots. Perhaps they have something they desire or an idea. So we provided them this choice, they explained. It's intriguing, but it's a nice feature. This is an internal combustion engine, and aside from the hybrid system, the most important thing this car requires is aerodynamics, as Bugattis are known for their high speeds, and this turbillion is no exception. It is restricted to 445 km per hour. Can it outperform this speed? Yes, but engineers limited it to this speed because of the batteries, tires, and safety. How did they change the aerodynamics? Generally, we talk about the aerodynamic drag coefficient, which ranges between 0.28 and 0.40. However, the coefficient isn't the sole factor. The region impacted by air from the front is also utilized to calculate aerodynamic forces. In other words, compare two automobiles with the same aerodynamic coefficient, the one that is wider, taller, and has a bigger frontal area will be slower. They wondered how we might make it smaller. This new hybrid system is a huge assistance here. Because, in order to create a four-wheel drive vehicle, Power must be sent to the Chiron's front wheels from the engine in the rear. That explains why there is a shaft in the center. The gearbox was in the front, between the two passengers, hence the packaging was quite tiny. However, with the current model, there is no power coming to the front. Instead, only electric motors are employed. There is no power transmission from the internal combustion engine in the back, hence the shaft between the front and back is unnecessary. Also, there is no need to install the gearbox in the front. It is mounted on the engine at the back. In this fashion, there is a space between the driver and the passenger. They place the batteries, but because it is thinner, it puts the passengers closer together. When it is near, they may make the car's external design even smaller, narrowing the front region in the process. At the same time, they change the seat so that they are semi-adjustable, which means that the seat only goes up and down, not back and forth. Instead. This is, you may bring the pedals and steering will closer to you, much as in a Ferrari. When you remove this additional mechanism from the seat, 
you may lower the seat and so maintain the ceiling lower. The center of gravity has migrated below, and the frontal area has shrunk. This is what blows my mind. They used a considerably bigger diffuser than previous cars, so when you look at it from the back, it is massive and goes past the rear bumper, making the car appear slightly longer. Of course, in addition to its intimidating appearance, it is also highly useful. The diffuser's rationale is to produce a downward force. That's why it has to spread from the car's bottom, which requires volume. They didn't have such a large area in the previous models. Because the W16 is a chubby engine with all those intercooler turbos, it didn't have that much volume. But when the V16 was passed, it became thinner and taller, so there was more room at the edges. That's why they made the diffuser such a huge one. Of course, we said that the diffuser needs to be opened, but you cannot do this at a very high angle. As a general rule, if there is a slope of more than 11 degrees, the flow will break and you cannot create this down force. If you want a diffuser this huge, and to preserve the angle, this diffuser must travel a significantly longer journey when viewed from beneath, therefore it begins in the middle of the car, nearly opening, and extends to the rear. Of course, there is another issue with having such a large diffuser at the rear. Again, it stems from the packing, which is the same for all vehicles. There is a crash bar at the front and back. This is composed of metal and is intended to cushion the force when you strike anything or when someone knocks you in the back. They stated that while Bugatti has this bar, it is not feasible to place this diffuser here or make it this large, making it problematic here. They came up with a whole new idea. Because the diffuser is so beautifully built, it also serves as a crash bar, absorbing the impact. As a result, there is no need for a very massive metal piece or bar. It is a single element that provides both aerodynamics and safety at once. This diffuser ensures that the wing has practically little influence. It no longer functional. Aerodynamically, the back wing still opens and closes, but they claim we mostly utilize it for braking. They now state it solely utilizes the handling mode. I mean, if the car is going to be on the track and needs additional downforce, this rear wing is functional. Aside from that, upon braking, it does all of the work on the road. Even if you go out forever, the diffuser will do its job. There is no need for an additional wing here. Of course, when we talk about such a hypercar, the weight comes up, and that is our topic for the fourth. They did not completely disclose the weight since they stated that the automobile was not yet ready. They swear it will be less than two tons. Chiron weighed roughly 1995 kilograms, but they think it will be lighter. It will most likely be only one to two kilograms lighter, so when totaled, we may call it a two-ton automobile. Of course, it is a bit much for a hypercar, and while it is not precisely the same, it is comparable to the McLaren P1 or Ferrari. Of course, they are on the lighter side, but since Bugatti wants to offer luxury at the same time. However, they turn to a new way to minimize weight, abandoning old methods such as suspension components while developing some elements. They created them using a 3D printer. Topological optimization is a process in which you specify how much force the part will bear, where the load will be, and where it will be attached, and all of these stress routes are computed, resulting in a form. They used a 3D printer to make them since standard CNC machines cannot. They claim to have gained a lot of weight here, but they did not specify how much. However, the suspension components are rather thin and light for a conventional automobile of this sort. But, at the end of the day, it is clear that they have accomplished significant engineering success. Of course, I won't ask you if you can afford to buy it for $4 million, but there are only around 300 individuals in the globe to buy. Can you purchase this car? You can leave your thoughts regarding this automobile or its innovative technology, as well as any questions or information you want us to provide, in the comments section below. I hope you liked this video and found it interesting and enlightening. As always, thank you for watching and I'll see you soon with more fun and informative content on the Engine University channel. Goodbye for now.